Big oil earnings are out today and they seem mediocre as declining natural gas prices weighed on results at Exxon and Chevron. Hi everyone, I'm Rosemarie Millard and I am joined here today by David Bonson, the Chief Investment Officer of the Bonson Group, to get some insight into the results at these two giants. Thank you so much for joining me today, David. Thank you for having me. Definitely. So, David, it looks like Chevron's report is a little better than Exxon's. It beat on the bottom line, but revenue missed and cash from operations came in below expectations. Can you tell us what's going on there? Well, you got to remember that both of these companies are up quite a bit year to date, in particular Exxon, which is down more today in the aftermath of the news, was up over 20 percent on the year coming into the announcement. In Chevron's case, there was more good than bad. Their Permian production in particular has outperformed expectations, but I think you just have a classic case of expectations being a little ahead of themselves. Natural gas pricing is a little factor, but refinery margins also increased. Ultimately, the biggest metric that matters is upstream production. That's where both of these companies generate over 80% of their earnings from. And on both fronts, those numbers were really quite good. Well, Exxon's results were clearly weaker with sales and profit missing Wall Street's forecasts. What is the source of the pressure there? So there's sort of two different uh, stories at play. Some of it was just the way in which when you talk about cash from operations, CapEx gets measured. Their full year CapEx, they're still guiding to be the same number, but CapEx on the quarter came in higher than expected. They're up to 3.8 million barrels per day of production upstream. Uh, but again, there were uh, margin issues that, that weighed on, on some of the earnings results. Uh, Exxon's a very complicated company, uh, even more so than Chevron in terms of just the gross level of capital expenditures that go into operating the company. You're talking about $5.8, $5.9 billion in one quarter for Exxon. So there's so many levers in which it could be um, up or down and, and get ahead of itself. We really, as longtime Exxon shareholders who have done extremely well with this company, force ourselves to look further out. Exxon is giving you rolling five-year projections that for from 2023 to 2027, they are anticipating $13 of profit per barrel of oil. And they're anticipating getting to 4.2 million barrels per day at the end of that five-year period. Uh, that's the type of metric we think investors ought to be looking at. Wow. Well, I know these two companies are fighting over who will acquire Hess. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I mean, there's no question Chevron's going to acquire Hess and Exxon, I do not believe, is trying to acquire Hess. They're biting off a very big mouthful with their acquisition of Pioneer, but they do have a joint venture with Hess that they are uh, making some legal noise around uh, a first right refusal clause. It gets very complicated legally. We've done a lot of analysis at my firm to understand it, and we uh, remain of the opinion it's sort of what they call Occam's razor, the most uh, logical, likely scenario here is that Exxon is merely setting things up to try to get some payment or settlement out of it because it does appear legally that Chevron and Hess have the stronger argument. Uh, Exxon has a vulnerability in the Guyana region and some of the political noise, geopolitical noise happening in Venezuela. Uh, but as far as the Hess matter, we expect that will get resolved. It may end up being a legal and, and settlement issue. But both Exxon's uh, acquisition of Pioneer and Chevron's acquisition of Hess, we think, will imminently close. Well, Exxon seems to be on a cost-cutting spree these days. Is that the right, the right course? Yeah, it's interesting. They're not cutting a lot out of CapEx, but they have cut a lot of, out of SG&A. And I think that's important to continue to maintain cost discipline. None of the big producers stuck to their guns in terms of cost discipline in the earlier part of last decade when the fracking revolution and a lot of U.S. Uh, production took off, uh, cost exploded and it came back to bite them. They're still investing uh, heavily in capital expenditures, but they're guiding the street with what those numbers will be. And I think that creates a capital discipline because if they get way in front of them, Wall Street will punish them. And uh, really, since the post-COVID moment, their CapEx has been more contained. 
but there has been other cost cutting and we see that as good prudent management. Well, more broadly, oil prices have been on a tear for the past year with crude sitting above $80 this month, but natural gas has been plunging. It's down to $1.62 from above uh, $3.50 in November. Why are the prices diverging and what does that mean for the oil companies? Yeah, and I push back on the idea that oil prices have been on a tear for a year. They were down last year and they were basically flat where they were 12 months ago or so, they've kind of vacillated around the mid 70s. They had gotten up to the mid 80s, as you point out, a few weeks ago, and now have come back down low 80s, mid 80s. It hasn't broken out above 90. Some were thinking there could be upward pressure there. Um, where, you know, oil is obviously supply and demand driven, and, and there are a million factors that go into it. Last year, I think Chinese demand underwhelmed markets. Uh, this year, there's some question about what Iranian supply will end up being. But for the most part, OPEC Plus has continued to keep production growth limited. And the U.S. has not done a very good job at refilling their strategic petroleum reserves. So you add to that some of the political vulnerabilities in, in the Middle East. You're ending up right now with low $80 oil. Your question about the divergence from natural gas, it's still answered in the context of supply and demand. Uh, natural gas demand was a little lower than forward expectations uh, and, and natural gas supply has been quite robust. Uh, so there, there are two just different supply demand economics. Natural gas is primarily used in our country for um, heating where, and, and electricity production and oil is primarily used for transportation. And so they just have two different uses. And of course, oil, more than natty gas, has much more of a global economic uh, dynamic. Well, David, after Chevron and Exxon pump their crude, some of it gets refined into gasoline and other chemicals. It seems like there's significant competition in the petrochemicals market. What effect is that having on the oil company's results? Well, it's a, that's a great question because there are some companies that we don't own that it's a huge impact because it's the core of their business or a much more meaningful percentage. As an integrated company, your Exxon and Chevrons are exposed upstream, midstream, and downstream. And the downstream aspect you ask about uh, has had an impact, but because it's less than 15% of their business, it has less of an impact. Refinery margins have, have improved this last quarter. Uh, last year, it was a little bit more of a headwind, but yet that was up against a real tailwind with other dynamics in the upstream business. So if one wants to play the refiners in a more peer level, they, they can buy a refinery company that's going to be more of a peer play. Uh, we don't do that, but uh, it's hard to get good dividend growth that's consistent out of the refiners because of the cyclicality of those businesses. But and the integrateds like an Exxon or Chevron, of course, there's other names out there as well. But those are the two that we believe you just get better balance sheet strength and a little less impact from global cyclicality, including refining. So let's talk about electric vehicles. They seem to be falling out of favor with consumers. Does this mean that gasoline may be in demand for longer than had been expected? And um, how are the major oil companies positioning themselves in terms of adding supply for the coming years? Uh, yes, the answer is it does uh, position the fossil oriented companies uh, better. Um, and, and I think it is a surprise to some. It's not a surprise to us. It's one of the nicest ways you could put it. it seemed to be falling out of favor. The electric vehicle sector is down 27% per year, three years in a row, if you compound the uh, three-year trailing return. It's an absolute bloodbath. And I believe that the terminal value pricing in so much of the midstream and upstream energy sector in our country that presupposed no use for fossil fuels by 2050 or 2040 or whatever the year was, is, is a really big miscalculation. Mm -hmm. And so exactly where consumers go with what they end up purchasing here and there, th those things are tougher to price. But the idea that there will be an entire electrification of the automotive industry and an entire disintermediation of uh, gasoline powered automobiles certainly seems to be uh, not the trend at the moment. Well, it's not the trend at the moment. What are companies doing to develop greener forms of energy? 
Well, Exxon in particular is a leader. I say all the time for those who want to see more renewables. Now, my view is that um, within fossil, the greater amount of use of natural gas to power electricity versus coal is the greenest thing anybody can do. And, and yet within uh, Exxon, they still have invested billions of dollars of resources into other renewable sources. And I think they have the balance sheet strength and the technology and the manpower. It's a much better vehicle for uh, developing some of these alternative energy sources than some of the money losers or subsidies or or crony uh, capitalism uh, arrangements that have been tried and failed. Uh, but really, when you're talking about a, a oil and gas company, their core competency is oil and gas. And I think that nobody could dispute that natural gas has proven to be one of the greenest alternatives to some of the prior sources of power that we've ever seen. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, David.